Welcome back everyone. What's the science behind that is my name, and what is the history behind that is my game. Briefly here, view discretion is advised, so everyone is indeed entitled to own opinions regarding certain subjects, and all that I'm asking is you respect my opinion regarding certain subjects. Okay, so for today's video, I would like to discuss the Biblical Gap Theory. Section 1, The Introduction by James Hutton. In 1759, James Hutton published a book called The Theory of the Earth, and in his book he proposed an old earth creationism worldview. It wasn't until 1814 when the gap theory became popularized by Thomas Chalmers, who basically attributed the concept to the 17th century Dutch Arminian theologian Simon Episcopius. Now this gained quite a lot of widespread attention when a second creative act was discussed prominently in the reference notes for Genesis and the influential 1917 Scofield Reference Bible. This book, by Ram, was influential in the formation of another alternative to gap creationism, which found favor with conservative members of the American Scientific Affiliation, or ASA for short, that being a progressive creationism. About 50 years after Chalmers' initial theory, the famous book of Charles Darwin was published, The Origins of Species. Now, the gap creationism also known as Ruin Restoration Creationism, Restoration Creationism, or simply the Gap Theory, is a form of Old Earth Creationism that posits that the six-day creation period as described in the Book of Genesis involves six literal 24-hour days, but that there was a gap of time between two distinct creations in the first and second verses of Genesis, which the theory claims many scientific observations, including that of the age of the Earth. Now this, however, unfortunately differs from the day-age creationism theory, which posits that the days of creation were much longer periods of time, thousands, possibly millions of years. And from young earth creationism, which although it agrees concerning the six little 24-hour days of creation, it however does not posit any gap of time between verse 1 and verse 2. Now by positing such an event, various observations on a wide range of fields including the age of the Earth, the age of the universe, the dinosaurs, fossils, ice cores, ice ages, and geologic formations are allowed by adherents to have occurred as outlined by science without actually contradicting the literal belief in Genesis. Section 2. What was James Hutton's theory? You see, gap theorists believe that there was a gap of time between the first two verses, and that there existed a pre adamic race of beings who lived in harmony well before Adam and Eve. Until one day, Lucifer rebelled and led this pre adamic race of beings into rebellion against God. This rebellion apparently forced God to destroy the entire universe with what the Gath theorists call the Luciferian Flood. And then for some random reason, God then decided to recreate the entire universe with verse 2 onwards. Then while in the process, God also destroyed the earth yet again with the great flood of Noah. Briefly here, I'm going to actually go ahead and read the first two verses of the Bible. <clears throat> Alright. Genesis 1-1 In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1-2 And the earth was without form and void. And the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Section 3. Debunking James Hutton's Version of the Gap Theory. And I will discuss more on that momentarily. Number 1. His theory has been proven false numerous times. Number 2. Tohu, which is used 20 times in the Old Testament with 10 different meanings. Tohu wo bohohu, as written in verse 2, literally means unformed and unfilled. Use Isaiah 45.19 and Job 26.7 for additional references. Number 3. Exodus 31.17 quite literally states that everything was created in six literal 24-hour days. Number 4. The word replenish as written in the dictionary in 1611 literally defined the word as to fill. It wasn't until 1650 when they added a second definition to the word, which means to refill. Number 5. Ezekiel 28, 13 through 15 makes it extremely clear that Lucifer was still good in the Garden of Eden. 
So please explain to me, how did he rebel in verse 2 if he was still good in the Garden of Eden? Number 6. Since angels were created to be ministering spirits for us, referencing Hebrews 1.14 and Matthew 18.10, why would God create them millions of years before man? Number 7. If Lucifer rebelled on day 2, then why does the Bible clearly state that Lucifer and the other angels rejoiced when the foundations of the earth were laid down on day 3? Job 38.1-4 and Genesis 1.9 Number 8. There was no death until Adam sinned. Thus, why wasn't death introduced before when Lucifer sinned? No logic there, is there? Number 9. Lucifer wanted to ascend above the stars, but guess what? They were not created until day 4. And finally, number 10. Wouldn't Noah's flood have destroyed this supposed evidence for the gap theory? Clearly, God stated in Genesis chapter 9, verse 11, that he would never again send another flood. Now, wouldn't this be contradictory to the gap theory? Hmm. You see, the real reason James Hutton and Thomas Chalmers' theory falls apart is because, at the time, this wasn't an actual historical position of the church, and it also violated scripture. Section 4. What does the Bible actually say on this topic? Let's start with Ezekiel 28, 13 through 6. Verse 13. Thou was in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. 14. Thou art the anointed cherub, that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou had walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. 15. Thou was perfect in every way from the day you were created until iniquity was found in thee. 16. By the abundance of your trading you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast thee as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you on the covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Note, the following verses helps give us clues as to what actually happened during the fall of Lucifer. Now, some other notes we should also be aware of when viewing these passages are, 1. As a reference towards Isaiah 14.13, it was quite clear that Lucifer wanted to ascend above the stars and sit on the throne of God, or in this case, the mountain of God, if you will. 2. It's clear that God was in the same domain as man. 3. The separation came after the casting out of the Garden of Eden with the way blocked to the Tree of Life. 4. This casting out wasn't just a simple spatial removal, but a dimensional shift. 5. The spiritual domain was basically divorced, if you will, from the natural or physical, and will be recombined when the New Jerusalem comes down, or out of heaven, if you will, and remains on earth forever. 6. A veil was brought out because of the sin, referencing Genesis 3.23-24. through 24. 7. And because of this veil, we cannot see God's face, referencing Exodus 33.30, as well as 1 John 3.2. In Ezekiel 1.26-28, through 28, for example, it states that the appearance of his waist and upwards was the color of amber, i.e. electricity, with the appearance of fire all around within it, and from the appearance of his waist downwards, was the appearance of fire with brightness all around. Clearly, this was the appearance of the likeliness of the glory of God. 8. Because of Lucifer's sin, the descendants of Adam and Eve became degenerate, or in other words, no longer compatible to walk with God. Matthew 22.30 Also note that because of this casting out, as mentioned in Ezekiel 28, 13-17, we learn that God judges Lucifer in the Garden of Eden. He later casts him out, and after some time, lays him before kings. Now, I will explain that momentarily. So here is a question. Why did Lucifer rebel, and what was it that made him so angry at God? Okay, here's what I think we should do. I think I should start off by reading the actual account of Lucifer tempting Eve in the Garden of Eden before actually answering the question. 
Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But other fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall surely not die. For God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast, was naked? Has thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou wast, shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman who gave us to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and the dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put a many between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire thou shalt be thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of thy tree, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it in all the days of thy life. Thorns and the thistles shall I bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. And in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou hast returned unto the ground, for out of thou was taken, for dust art thou, and unto the dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And unto Adam also to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin, and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out of the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden, cherubims, and the flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way from the tree of life. Now this was the account of Lucifer tempting Eve. Now let's get on with the question. Why did Lucifer rebel, and why was he so angry at God? The reason being is because Lucifer rebelled because of the fact God had gave domain to Adam instead of him. This was referenced in Psalm 8, 5 through 8 of the ISV version of the Bible. Now when Lucifer didn't receive the domain, he became corrupted on account of his splendor. Referenced in Ezekiel twenty eight seventeen of the NET version of the Bible. Now because of this fact, we are told that in Mark 9.35, I believe, as well as John 13.14-15, through 15, that Lucifer refused to become a servant. Now because Lucifer was of the highest ranking at the time, 
he would also have to become the servant. Now, this is the principle that we see throughout Scripture. Take Matthew twenty twenty-five through 28, for example. We see in Scripture that the older shall serve the younger, the stronger shall serve the weaker. The way God showed his love was by performing an act of service. This was by far the greatest demonstration of love that we have, which is to do something sacrificial and do something for another. Take uh, Philippians 2, 7 through 8, for example. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeliness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. That was from Philippians 2, 7 through 8. So you see, as we learn from Matthew 18.4, God wasn't requiring anything out of Lucifer. He was only requiring his service. Next question. Who exactly did Lucifer need to serve? The answer is Adam and Eve. Now this is why he refused to be a servant. This was the reason he was filled with iniquity. Referencing Ezekiel 28.15. In Hebrews 1.14, for example, we see that the angels weren't all ministering spirits who were sent to minister for those who will inherit salvation. From what we've learned thus far is that Adam, in the beginning, was perfect without death and had to exercise his free will. You might be wondering, why on earth would Adam need to exercise his free will? That, my friends, is an excellent question. From what we see in Genesis 3:22 through 23 is that Adam was in need of eternal life, so the angels were created to be a servant to him and his kin. Now getting back to why God lay Lucifer before kings, he did so because of his slandering, referencing Ezekiel 28:16. While Lucifer was in the garden, He didn't like the fact that he was to be a servant of Adam, so this was the real reason why he tempted Eve to eat the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You see, with varying opinions and the snake of Eden, like an account I just read, only a few things may have happened. Either it was a real snake who was possessed by Lucifer, or this was supposed to be a passage that was speaking about Lucifer metaphorically. You see the point? After Lucifer was cast out of the Garden of Eden, he spent what I believe to be the next 1,647 years causing havoc, creating Nephilim beings, displaying his public image, so on and so forth. Now just a quick side note here. Lucifer, as mentioned in Isaiah 14.12, means Hylil. Now... This is basically synonymous with the Akkadian, Elil, and the Sumerian, Enlil. The Hebrew, Hylil, is the equivalent, phonetically, to the Akkadian, Elil. Now, one could reasonably expect the HLL to be the Western somatic form of Elil. Now, just as some tablets suggest, Elil came into Western somatics directly from Sumerian. Also note that a similarity between the Bible and the Sumerian historian was the corruption of one-third of God's angels. The Sumerians make a brief mention to Lucifer being God of 33 stars. Keep in mind that 33 out of 100 is one-third. Also a reference in the book of Isaiah. I also want to make a comparison between the Bible and Elil's description. I will be doing this in a very unique fashion. 1. His name was Halil, Isaiah 14.12 in the Bible, 1a. Halil equivalent of Elil from Elil's description. 2. He was the son of Don from the Bible, 2a. He causes the dawn from Elil's description. 3. He laid down from the nations from the Bible, 3a. Elil was a devastation. His astral functions was immense from Elil's description. 4. He aspired to set up his throne above the stars of El. From the Bible. 4a. 
Alil was amongst the most prominent members in it, from Alil's description. 5. He aspired to sit in the Mount of Assembly and on Sephron. Chapter 14, verse 13 in the Bible. 5a. Alil was the highest in Mesopotamia until the end of the second millennium. Alil's description. 6. He aspired to be like the Most High. Chapter 14, verse 14 in the Bible. He also fell down to the earth and into the midst of a pit. Also chapter 14, verses 12 through 15 in the Bible. 6a. Elil's fall into the underworld is recorded in first millennium texts. Elil's description. Please also keep in mind that similarities exist between the Sumerian cylinder seal and the book of Daniel. For example, Elil is portrayed wearing a crown of thorns as a symbol of his power. The crown usually has between 8 to 10 horns. Now in the book of Daniel, we read about a dragon with 10 horns. Some other interesting things to note is that in the Sumerian Tablets of Destiny, we see that Elil, or Lucifer in this case, had possession of these tablets which gave him power over the entire cosmos and the affairs of men. These tablets allowed Lucifer to be head of the pantheon instead of the heavenly god Yahweh. So essentially what happened was that Lucifer came into the name of God and turned the people against the real creator of the universe. Lucifer corrupted man and God's creation. Please also note that given when the two-sided scroll is open, cataclysms begin happening on the earth. It's therefore reasonable to assume that the scroll is in fact the title deed to the earth, or in this case, the tablets of destiny. I personally believe that the redemptive clause to the title deed of the earth was the reason Jesus died on the cross. He had to pay for our sins and give us salvation. You see, this was also a part of God's plan to defeat Lucifer and take back ownership of the universe, also referenced in the Book of Jubilees. Alrighty, we are now entering Section 5, the Book of First Enoch. The Book of First Enoch was basically an attempt to explain Genesis 6-4. Genesis 6-4 states that the Nephilim was in the earth in those days, after the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bore children unto them, and the same were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. A closer look reveals more about what Lucifer had done and how he corrupted God's creation. In the book of First Enoch, we learn that the so-called giants, or Nephilim, as mentioned in Genesis 6-4, tells us that these beings were actually destroyed by the flood of Noah. The evidence that backs this up is found in 2 Peter 2.5, which states that all of these ungodly beings were wiped out in the flood. The Bible explains to us that because of Adam's sin and Lucifer's deceiving, all of the wicked upon humanity except those aboard the ark were killed. Thus, the Nephilim did not survive the flood. The truth is that... In the book of 1st Enoch, we read how the watchers fathered the race of giants and how these giants were killed in the flood. I think it is extremely important to note exactly who the Jewish writers imagined the giants and or Nephilim were. You see, in the book of the so-called book of giants, we know exactly who they were for they were actually named. They were Gilgamesh, Himbeba, and some other figures from Mesopotamian history. Section 6, The Origins of Angels and Demons. In Job 38, 4, day 1, God says, Where will you when I lay the foundations of the earth? To where his foundations fasten? Where I laid its cornerstone, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Day 2, from Job 38, 4 through 7. Reverencing Psalm 148, 2 through 6 of the ISV, it states, Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his armies. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you heaven of heaven, for he, for he himself have gave the command, I'm placed to last forever and ever. He gave the command, and it will not rescind it. Day 3. So as we can clearly see, angels were most likely created on the second day of the creation week. And after Lucifer rebelled, that's when all the demons were created. Briefly here, uh, in section 7, I just want to bring up some topics 
that we may or may not explore during this theory. 1. The origins of angels and demons, angelology and demonology, the Holy Civil War, Azrael the Grim Reaper, scientific proof for the serpent's curse, planet Rahab and the asteroid belt theory, the heavy bombardment era, the Pleiadian star theory, heaven, hell, purgatory, and limbo, the land's book of life and the book of death, why God allows evil, biblical giants, extraterrestrial aliens, and finally, the canopy theory. So for the purpose of today's video, I will only be looking at the Holy Civil War. The other areas will have to be separate videos by themselves, unfortunately. Now going back to what I said earlier about Isaiah 14.12, where Lucifer corrupted one third of God's angels and led them into rebellion against God. As we celebrate the great feast of St. Michael the Archangel on September the 29th, let us take a look at the great cosmic battle between St. Michael and Lucifer as we explore how Michael was able to cast out Satan and his cohort of fallen angels. Now because of Lucifer's hatred towards God, there will be at some point in time a great battle between the good and the evil. Lucifer will soon be defeated by the Archangel Michael. The Archangel Michael, who reigns as the leader of all of God's angels, fights evil with the power of good. Michael has engaged in spiritual battles with the fallen angels, especially Satan, numerous times throughout history. The Bible clearly says that the struggle will reach a climax in the future just before Jesus returns to the earth in Revelation 12, 7 through 10. The Bible tells us how Michael and the angels he supervises will defeat Satan and the other rebellious angels during the world's end time. The Bible presents a vision of the initial battle in Revelation 12, 7 through 9, which clearly states, and I quote, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Note, the dragon represents evil, and there is no better angel than Archangel Michael, warrior of good, to battle darkness. The archangel rounded up his band of angel warriors and dispatched the fire-breathing monster and his army in one verse. Considering it is against the usual uh, lacrocautiousness of the Bible's authors, we can assume that this was one quick battle. So the moral of the Civil War story essentially, is that all of Satan's attempts to oppose God throughout history or in the future will and have failed. And he will lose this final angelic battle as well. Satan will suffer such a complete defeat that there will no longer be a place for him or for his demon hosts in heaven. Every inch of heaven, as it were, will be thoroughly scoured and all the rebellious fallen angels thoroughly cast out. They will no longer have access to God's presence and Satan will never again accuse believers before God's throne. When Michael defeats Lucifer, he will do so with the all-legendary sword of angel. A sword so powerful that it was literally forged with the powers of heaven itself. Now once Lucifer is finally laid to rest, it is said that there will be a rejoicing so, for example, Revelation 12.10-12 through 12 provides more details on angels versus demons. Here's what it has to say. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven which states, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumph over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink them from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you have who dwell in them. But woe to the earth 
and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Well, that pretty much wraps up today's video. If any further questions or comments, please let me know below. And until next time, ciao everyone.